Hi, my name is Mike Creedon, uh, Technical Director, Design Education at Inselectro. I had the pleasure to be here at the PCEA Silicon Valley uh, Affiliate Group. PCEA is the new association that stands for Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Um, we are basically rolling this new group out this year, and our mission is to be a forum where we can collaborate with one another, to inspire one another, and also education. Many design professionals performing printed circuit engineering and our goal is whether or not you're a fabricator, an assembler, uh, an engineer doing layout, material science, whatever that is, uh, we encourage you to come out and join one of the existing affiliate groups. Traditionally, we were the IPC Designers Council, and that's kind of shifting now. There's uh, IPC is a global trade organization for the electronics industry, founded in 1957. This is our 63rd year. They are an industry standards to worldwide, and we're all using those standards. IPC Designers Council was formed in 1991, and I think I've been president since about then. But things are about to change. So. I don't know if you've read any of the, the literature that's gone out already. IPC is kind of changing the Designers Council to, to IPC Design. They've kind of disbanded the, the Designers Council, but there's a PCEA thing for me. Now, I want to bring up Mike Creedon, who's the, uh, from CID Plus in, in Selectra. He's a technical director of design education. He's going to talk a little bit more about the whole Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Nice, thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Good. Okay, good. good. So, as you see, Mike Creighton, I'm a CID plus. Are there any other CIDs in this room? All right, man. Small, small applause for that. Well done. <laughs> I recognize a handful of faces here. I've had the opportunity to work with you on that, and glad to see some familiar faces out there. Um, so. Again, I work, uh, I had a printed circuit board design engineering services. I sold that three years ago. And a year, uh, about a year ago, I hired into Inselectro. Inselectro is a distributor for high speed laminates of Isola, DuPont, and Ormet uh, Sintering Vias. And so my role is technical director of design education. You truly need anybody to look signal integrity wise at a design. That's what I do. It's free, and I'm not going to do it forever for free for you. My goal is to teach you what I know and therefore pass it on. My goal is that you're building a buildable board. So you want to take one of my business cards uh, or see Bob to get a hold of me. So that's enough of my professional pitch. Um, I'm here to talk about IPC and the Designers Council, um, a little bit of the history, what occurred, and what might be coming next. Um, so. Essentially, he talked about the IPC Designers Council. I'm one of those guys that have been doing this for a while. This is my 44th year in this industry. Um, I love it. You know, I can tell you some history. I actually worked in this building here. I was a field applications engineer here. But I'm not going to bore you with my dinosaur stories. Um, what I will tell you is I have a passion for this industry, and I try to bring that wherever I go. I'm very grateful for it. Um, so I put myself as service. Okay, one of the service commitments I've taken on over the years, since 1993, I have, like Bob, been serving as an officer in the Designers Council. Okay, the Designers Council historically had a few responsibilities. Um, one was to provide a network forum, like we're doing here, to bring education and content, a place for you guys to network. When I say guys, I mean guys and girls. Thank you. Um, also, we were uh, chartered with creating the education portion of it, uh, whereby the CID and CID Plus. Um, I actually had the privilege to, to teach that, as I've seen some of my students in the group here. I actually had the opportunity to serve and write the CID Plus. I'm probably the majority contributor for that, 
And again, I call it a privilege, but it took a lot of volunteer hours to do that. Um, I am going to talk about IPC, but let me first say this. I'm the one that actually coined the phrase, IPC is not a them, it's an us. And I say that is because for the most part, IPC is a handful of marketing people that work remote, but it really, IPC is us showing up and accomplishing change together. And uh, I encourage you to get involved. I serve as the chairperson for the 2200 series, one of the 2200 series, 2221 and 22, which is the design of Rigid and Flex. And I really need designers to come out to this because right now a bunch of mill arrow fabricators, God bless them, but they shouldn't be the one designing or defining our design standards. So I'm encouraging participation in that. Um, I'm encouraging everyone to remain a faithful um, IPC citizen. We build to those standards. And uh, so I highly encourage you to know them and pursue that part of your professional uh, value you bring to your end customer. So um, again, having served with IPC for a long period of time, um, I have a lot of history with them. Um, what occurred on November, I think it was 19, 2019, um, we were called into a meeting and just said, the Designers Council, as you know it, is dissolved. There's kind of crickets in the room. And um, because what, one of the things we've been doing is um, myself and Bob, as you, Bob who has served you guys well. Can I get a round of applause for Bob? Thank you, Bob. Bob has served and helped form this chapter and it's volunteers like that that have made this a success. And I just see essentially kind of ignored the Designers Council. Um, they've admitted it for some 15 years. And, um, but it's grown. We now have, there's like 700 members, okay? And the only feeling pretty much was a little bit of disbelief when we were told we were disbanded is the very best advocates in this profession were us. Most of the uh, executive members are all CID instructors, um, Rick Hartley, Susie Webb, Gary Ferrari, and many of the chapter uh, chairs like Bob. And so the disbelief of why would you kind of get rid of some of your best advocates? So, um, but our purpose, our determination was to stay positive and professional. So to that end, that's the disclaimer of that. Um, where IPC is going in their next adventure, I am not going to speak for them. They have been speaking for themselves and they need to. But essentially, all of the chapters, and you're one of the last ones I've visited, um, I, I, Gary's visited some, Steph Chavez, a few other people have visited the other chapters, have said, we kind of like to continue with our existing leadership and continue to main, remain autonomous. And so we're forming a new entity called Printed Circuit Engineering Association. Not so much design, because all of those of you know, the majority of people doing it layout right now are engineers doing it. And to the degree you're a designer, you're doing a printed circuit engineering function. So we're not conferring an engineering degree. What we're saying is you're serving in an engineering capacity. And we're also deferring to the majority of the people doing it are double E's. Um, but we want to make it broad. If you're involved in any way, shape, or form in the printed circuit engineering, uh, we want you to feel welcome. Fabricators, assemblers, um, double E's doing schematics, layout, materials, anybody is welcome. And um, essentially, he'll speak at some point. You know, there's, it, it's not a hard membership. You have the ability to define your own rules and function as you have been. Um, so it, it will not be like a tight uh, set of constraints placed on you. You're pretty much given the freedom to do what you want to, but there is an oversight body, which is a, a 501c6, uh, which is a nonprofit business entity. And so that's essentially the governance of it. And there are 14 executive board members. And again, we're close to 700 people that's not only national but international who have formed affiliate groups with the PCEA uh, website, there's a Twitter page, a LinkedIn handle, all those things are coming, but it's still in the formation. And it is our goal to be professional to 
all the three and four letter acronyms that exist out there, we really want to collaborate with, you know, SMTA, IEEE, IPC. The other organizations truly want to work with them because we know that in your fields, you have to work with all those different aspects. So that's essentially, there should be no significant changes for any of the affiliated groups, okay? Um, <laughs> but really just want to promote the engineering as a profession. Um, essentially, more information. I had the, uh, ability, uh, the opportunity to do an on-track design podcast where I got to speak Judy Warren. Everybody kind of knows Judy out there. Uh, usually, you know, she's kind of like a unicorn in our industry. She does a lot. Um, so I did a, uh, an hour po uh, podcast with her. It should be out in about a, uh, a week. And so we will have uh, endorsements from and sponsors from all the major CAD companies that said we're eager to support you. And the two trade magazines that we have a monthly article, we will continue to do that that announces the activities and events throughout the industry and representing your chapter. Um, so those will continue. Um, Polar, Inselector, many other sponsors that are out there. And again, the goal is just truly to serve you guys. So that's pretty much what I've got on this. Um, we don't want to do a lot of questions, but I'd gladly welcome a few if anyone's got any quick questions, concerns, or thoughts on this. Anybody want to what's ask the a vision couple? For PCEA? We're recording this. My show. question is what's the vision for PCEA? The, the vision essentially is to um, collaborate, to inspire you to be a better professional, and uh, essentially to educate. Okay, the, uh, again, the CID plus IPC is probably going to change that. It, it's not been 100% determined. I will eagerly teach that as long as they'll have me because I value it. Um, one of the things that they've, uh, was probably the issue they disbanded the group was we didn't want to have it expire. They talked about it needing to be recertified. And um, if you had to take your CID, would you want to have to recertify every two years to take that? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? You'd like to take it every two years? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the point is, is um, and there's a reason why. There's a good reason why IPC is doing this. They have a, uh, they're seeking ISO 9000, if you've ever been involved in that. Um, they have a policies and procedures, which I teach, which means that every two years, if you're running a million dollar assembly line or fab line, you need to certify your competency. In design, that's difficult because you have the subjectivity of tool expertise, which makes competency difficult to measure. So CID is a knowledge base, not a competency base. So our goal is to um, collaborate, uh, inspire, and educate. Any other questions, please? Let me give you the mic because we're recording. I want to do thank uh, Sierra Circuits. They're recording and also Cadence is recording. So we're getting two recordings this time. Any other questions? Everybody good to want to be part of the PCEA? See a hand of, show of hands? Anybody don't want to be part of the PCEA? Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. And uh, get, get a business card. If, if anything else, I can follow up and help you with it. Eager to do so. Thank you. Uh, so upcoming dates, uh, next April 23rd will be at Amazon, Altium is our host, July 23rd is Minter, and October 22nd is uh, at Footprint KU, hosted by Zukin. Uh, I'm going to blow through these events here, um, you'll see them. In, so now I want to bring up Fazo, he's also a CID Plus, and he uh, works for, for Cadence, and he's going to do the sponsor spotlight here. ECB this chapter meeting, IPC chapter for about a decade now. Most of you have seen me around. Uh, with Cadence, it's been five years for me. And today I'll just cover like a little bit of how the Allegro suit has changed over time and what are the new features we have introduced in that. 
So just with show of hands, how many have used the new toolkit in 17.4 or have seen that so far? And you guys kind of like it? How's the... So basically, like if you look at the PCB design itself, so we are kind of at the junction of where the electrical world meets the physical world, right? So we have to convert electrical design into something which is which have look and feel of it. So there is always like a constant fight between SIP engineer and a manufacturer engineer that okay, you want to have a zero then tolerance or zero tolerance and the manufacturer says that it cannot be achieved, right? And those things you are always fighting. <coughs> so you are at the rear of it. And it gets more complicated when you involve the, all the shrinking of size and real estate and all those things with that. So what Cadence does is <coughs> as a policy we are looking for more of a solution now rather than like point based uh, thing. So we are taking Allegro as kind of our real uh, center point. And we are integrating the manufacturing, the SAPI, and everything into the network itself. So I will be covering these four points. So the first and foremost is our manufacturing tool that we are bringing into the group. <coughs> because the main idea for designing PCB is to manufacture it. Right? And what today is happening is you go with a lot of iteration cycles with the manufacturer that what is possible and what is not possible. And at different points, you run batch tests, and that takes time because you have to stop your design, the manufacturer has to run the checks, give you feedback, and you go into that iteration cycle multiple times before you go into that like uh, final design release. These are just some of the problems that you identify. Mostly it's the solder mask errors, annular rings, all those things, right, which are non-electrical errors that you find through the manufacturer. What it has introduced uh, is like a true design solution. So what we do is we ask the manufacturer to give us their rules, we import into Cadence, and while you're designing, it's all real time for you. Right? So while you're designing, all the rules are checked like your regular DRC, but they're independent of your current electrical DRCs that are set there. So your manufacturing DRCs are also checked similar to your electrical DRCs checked. Once you're done with your design, because all the rules have been provided to you by manufacturer, all have been checked, but now at final stage, you just want to make sure that the output that you've just generated matches everything. So you need to run the batch check one time, and then you're good to go. Our hope is that you don't need to do any iteration at that point in time. So Sierra is one of our partners, and they can provide all the design rules that you need to bring into the right? present time. With the same thing, moving from the physical world to electrical world, we did the same thing that once you go into that cycle, so every time once you are at a stage of design, you have to do a cross-function release so that SIP engineers can bring their board into their simulation tool, do the setup, run through the checks, and go through that whole iteration cycle again, right? And they give you feedback, you fix eight out of 10 checks, and then you throw them back, and then you introduce two more by fixing the eight that you have done, right? So you go into that iter endless iteration cycles before you can release the board perfectly. So what Cadence has done is we have bring our simulation tool, which was Sigrity, and it is well renowned in the industry for so long. So what we have bring that engine into Allegro itself. So now the SIP engineer can do the setup, and once the setup is done, you bring it to Allegro, and the PCB designer, as you're running into design, you can run the simulation within Allegro, and you can see the result, fix it, rerun it. So it's up to you. Once you're done with your design, you send it to SAP engineer for detailed analysis. So you get all the checks within Allegro canvas. You don't have to go through the iteration cycle multiple times. With that, what we have done is we have bring something which is called collaborative designing, and we call it Symphony. So what it is, is basically everything is moving to cloud right now. So it's basically the same database and it's accessed by multiple, multiple departments and multiple PCB designers at the same time. So like you have an Excel sheet on your cloud and multiple people can come in and work on it. Same thing, it will be one Allegro database which is resides on the server and then multiple people can come into it and do their work. 
without changing or moving, doing anything. There is no file transfer. This was like our traditional way of doing it, uh, the line partitioning, which has been in Allegro for quite some time now. So what that was, was that you take Allegro board and you just partition into multiple pieces and give partition to different pieces of designers to speed up the routing and all those things. Right? There were some inherent like, uh, problems with that. But this is the concurrent design is the cloud base, no database changing. Everybody comes and access the database and works on it. Right? So the biggest drawback of design partitioning was there were like inherent issues like you cannot cross the boundaries and the things that cross the boundaries you were limited. But I think the biggest one was that the cross-functional teams have no value of it. So like if you cannot give a portion of the board to SI engineer and say run simulation on it. <laughs> You have to merge it and then give the whole board to them. But with this approach, with this symphony approach, it is kind of the canoeing effort, we call it. It is basically like everybody, like cross-functional teams, they work together on the same database. So you speed up the whole process altogether. Right? So it is basically we think that it is 80% of the design cycle that we can, uh, we can make more efficient with symphony. And you can reduce the time of that 80% significantly by everybody logging into the Symphony server at the same time. So there are two ways of doing it. One is informal and one is formal. Formal is pretty much like for the enterprises where you have server setting and the database resides on the server. Everybody kind of logs in and has access to it. Informal is like I have a on my uh, PC running. And then I just want help from somebody, or I want to share it with somebody. I just start a Symfony server on my system by itself, and then you can just access it accessing my system. So it's like more of a point to point, but that can also be done. This is just some of the pictures. So like on the on this side, you can see that three different people are running it. At the bottom, you can see three people are running it. As soon as one person accesses it, so you can see three cursors, right? So one is green. So three people are working on the design at the same time. As soon as one person starts working on an object, that object gets locked for everybody else until that person is done using that object. I'll just show like a short video also on that. Also, like once the object is locked, you can see that who is using or who is working on that object. So we have different colors to show it, and also you can look at the name of the person. As well as the other thing that is introduced for the 3D view. That was introduced in 17.2, but it is much more enhanced in the new release that is just run in October 2019, that is 17.2. So before you, if you have like no shaded view, now you can have shaded view of all the objects that are there. Plus, it is much more realistic view. Now you can have non faded holes and all those things are also you can see in the 3D canvas. This is just a short video. I'm just trying to show you some of the features of it. So this is how you just start like an informal session of Symphony. You just go and start the session. So you see, <coughs> over here you get the IP address of it and the machine name. So you share that, and then other person can just use that and log into your Symphony server. So now you can see the three people are working simultaneously on the board. Like one person is working on these like uh, traces to lens match them. The other person is doing placement on this area. So you can see as he is moving the part, you can see that part gets locked for you. And then once he is done with his uh, move, you can see all the placement would be done here in your session. So it's like three person looking at three different screens at the same time. You can see you can see in blue color for this person and green color for this person. Right? So as soon as you mark it done, your components move to these places. Right? Just let you observe it for a while. 
So it's very smooth. There is no no lot of setup or server settings or anything required to run this. Like it's very simple, just like file sharing you do today. So there is no complications or any different kind of server setting required. And not only you can do design, you can run simulations on it, you can import that edge, you can do constraints, everything you can do at the same time in the sub server. But at like when you're doing database changes, you just have to like pause it and do it. You have voice chat in this or would somebody use like Discord and they want to so that is, it is not integrated into the solution, but we believe that all the companies and everybody, they have some sort of like communication tool they have within their company. So that's why we don't want to reinvent kind of that thing today. If you have a question, please raise your hand so I can bring you the mic. <laughs> you can see it's pretty real time as it is done. So this way you can see this is the new 17.4 look and feel. So we have, everything is going to dark theme. You can see your windows, back, everybody. So this is kind of the new dark theme. Your icons are changing. Everything is kind of you feel the new look in that. There's a lot of effort done on the UI section to have a very symmetrical UI between your schematic tool, PCB, and simulation tools. So that effort is being also done. So this is just showing you how the simulation is run while you're in the design. So you just draw a trace you did the lens matching, and you can come here and just run your analysis. So this analysis was set up by the SI engineer first time, right? Now you just run the analysis, and you can see that there is a red color there, right? It means there is some error there. You can come look at it. You can see, oh, the plane was not there underneath it. So you can just move the plane, or you can move your traces as, as it is. You fix it right there, and you're good to go. So you don't have to wait for the SI engineer to tell you like this kind of minor thing for you. Same thing, this is the manufacturing that is shown here. And as you can see, there are solar mask issues. They were there. You fix the pad stack, and boom, they are done. These were some of the customer testimonies that we have. Uh, I'll just pass on the mic to Atar. But if you have any questions, I am here to answer right now or after the presentation. So 16.6 basically has been obsolete. Uh, we have year. a lot of customers that use it, so we do designs in a, in, you know, in a higher version and then they want it done through the web and sometimes it's fun. So basically the way software industry moves up, right? Yeah. So with Cadence policy is like, because so much database changes has been done, so it's very impractical to bring something which you're using in 72 back to 16.6 because a lot of the functionality and features doesn't exist in 16.6. Yeah. So it's very it's very difficult to translate the design. And then the thing is like you move always up. So now it's, now you're at 17.4, almost like eight releases out of 16.6. Any other questions? So. So now we're going to bring up our presenter, our main presenter. This is uh, Atar Mittal. He's the general manager of design and assembly divisions at Sierra Circuits. And he's uh, going to give us a nice presentation regarding the causes of signal degradation on PCB transmission lines. This is a big round of applause for Atar. Good afternoon. Uh, it's glad to see so many designers and all people associated with the PCB design over here. Sierra Circuits, as <coughs> most of you may be aware, we are a PCB manufacturing and assembly company. So we 
encounter almost 80 to 100 design inquiry, uh, PCB manufacturing inquiries every day. And uh, the variety of the Gerbers and the CAD data that we receive is phenomenal, is phenomenal. I just thinking about it when the Cadence presentation was going on and we use, uh, we also have a design group and uh, we use Allegro also, we use Altier, you know, depending upon the customer's preferences. And I was, when the Allegro presentation was just now going on, I was thinking of so many sophisticated and so many time-saving tools over there, but some of the data that we receive as PCB manufacturer even today, you're talking about 16.6 .6 version of Allegro, even the older versions. We get data today. We get the data from all kinds of, you know, maybe the CAD software, last 20 years, and the old ORCAD, all those kind of things. So it is uh, one of the things that we find as a challenge to basically give feedback and, you know, uh, how to, uh, you know, analyze that data in a more efficient and quicker manner. So we are always trying to develop some kind of tools to basically automate that process as much as we can of analysis. That thought just occurred to my mind as the presentation. Another thing which I would like to say is that tools have become very sophisticated today, but I doubt whether most of the designers are able to use most of the power of those tools. I think there is a wide gap between training of design engineers and the tools. And the reason why I'm saying this is that we face a lot of questions from designers as to how to use this particular feature in that particular tool. And uh, some of our design group people are constantly since morning till evening, they are busy in answer, answering all those kind of questions. So I, I think that is, since we are talking of a new uh, designers cons council over here, that is one of the things we should think about as to how to spread the, let us say, the usefulness of the tools to the designer community in general, because it's a, it's a very large community. My presentation is not going to be, I, I was not aware of the fact as to what is the audience going to be. I see that a lot of experienced and you know, knowledgeable designers are over here, so it may appear to be very elementary, but idea was <coughs> to put together the, you know, from a designer's perspective and from a fabrication perspective. Basically, my emphasis here will be, I'll try to give a, as much of manufacturer's view, viewpoint to the PCB design as possible over here. So, some of the things I will skip from here because most of the people you are aware of it. This is, there are two points which I'd like to emphasize here which most of the layout designers are not familiar with though the circuit designers are, that the, the, you know, what, what length of the line should be treated as a control impedance line and what we can avoid using as a control impedance line. So I just given some kind of a, you know, rough formula over here that if it is you know, 0 0.2, uh, 
fastest rise time divided by the you know the propagation delay per unit length then the signal propagation time cannot be ignored and the signals will have to be treated you know as a, a as a control impedance line at the end of this i give on some derivations of you know estimating these parameters in a very simple manner from you know some of the brief data that is available now of course this if you have a uh, simulation tool or a field solver integrated into your design tool then of course all those things you will possibly get from there but these are simple estimators over here i was let me an incident came across to us about 3 days ago our production people were looking at one of the fab drawings of a pcb which had come for us for fabrication and the requirement over there which was mentioned over there that we want this is the impedance table so some of the micro strips were 50 ohm lines and there was another comment written over there that i would like my lines to be more capacitive than inductive i mean so our fabrication people were quite puzzled by that they had never come across such a uh, statement earlier so they rang me and they asked that what does it mean i mean do i take care of the 50 ohm aspect of it or how do i make the lines more capacitive than inductive There's so many design issues. Can somebody give me an idea? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what? There was also already a stack of design associated with that. So, so finally, our one of our des. designers replied to him that if you want a 50 ohm line and you want if you want it to be more capacitive maybe you don't need 50 ohm you possibly need a you know lesser impedance maybe 40 ohms because once 50 ohm is specified your inductance and capacitance are fixed so i was just trying to Uh, give this instance to tell you that what kind of let us say uh, you know requirements that we get and sometimes they are quite out of the line in my opinion okay i'll just go ahead with this one the most of you are aware of it the why we have uh, control impedance lines is that so that we can avoid reflections and uh, avoid signal degradation cross talk is another uh, reason why that has to be taken care of in the design the losses in due to pcb materials not too many designers are familiar with this this is a subject which i don't think uh, uh, definitely the body of you know layout designers are not familiar with this topic some of the schematic designers they may specify something but even that i doubt whether they are really fully well versed on as to how to take care of the losses over there so effectively what happens is that most of the material specifications are over specified many of the times i want a very very high loss material and uh, 
you know, some, sometimes that kind of thing happens also. When there are cost pressures, then the request that comes to us is, you know, we want to use just simple FR4 and nothing else. And uh, our board behaves, used to work pretty fine 10 years ago, so let it also work now. So we don't want to use any more expensive material. Somehow the feeling in the mind of most engineers, layout designers, and even the system designers is that high performance materials are going to be extremely expensive. I would like to say that material cost in the whole process of fabrication is a part of the total cost. So it has to be looked at from that perspective and not, you know, just preconceived notions of that. So I'm going to talk about how to select the materials also over here. Any nor uniformity is going to cause reflection. Most of you are aware of that. If the uh, impedance is, uh, uh, you know, non-uniformity, impedance depends on the geometry of the whole thing and the material properties. And if there is any non-uniformity, it is going to cause a, some amount of reflef reflection. So we have to. And so depending upon how critical your application and what is the tolerance of the, you know, impedances that you have put over there, that's the amount of care one the manufacturer has to take. If you have to, most of the IPC class 2 specification, of course, talks of, you know, 10% control impedance tolerance. Nowadays, 5% has become also pretty common. The manufacturing tolerance, manufacturing tolerances and manufacturing controls are much better. The materials are also far more uniform in properties and character, and that helps us to achieve, you know, five percent control impedance reasonably uh, across the line. The now things like written path not covering the signal lines and gaps. Just now we saw one of the pictures from the cadence tool where the, you know, the plane was not completely covering. That happens quite often. You would be surprised that many things that we receive, somebody says, I want a five mil line to have a 50 ohm impedance on layer four, and I also want a 75 ohm line of the same width on the same layer. When we ask where are the reference planes, they have some of them have no idea of what a reference plane is. So this is a big confusion. I mean. I'm sure in this audience, everyone is very well versed about the theory and all that stuff. But we as a PCB manufacturer deal with this situation all the time. So the education regarding how to basically design control impedance lines and how to basically, what are the minimum, what are the maximum plane coverage that is required for those lines, how to avoid gaps, what are the disadvantages of those gaps, those are issues which most, I mean, all of us have been hearing about these things in all courses, seminar, I mean, in PCB West and all other places, but still they are not completely understood. Another thing which is the very word impedance many times is very confusing to a lot of people. It 
and especially the layout designers that what do you mean by impedance impedance when we talk of control impedance of 50 ohms we're not talking of the dc resistance of that line we're talking of the the capacity the basically how is the impedance felt by far the ac signals as it progresses over the line so every point has an impedance and if the impedance is the same over the complete line we say that it, the line has been designed as a controlled impedance line vias definitely needs to be uh, looked at their sizes have to be looked at some of estimation as to if you are taking a signal a control impedance line from one layer to the another line then what size of vr to be used over there whether it will cause a drastic uh, discontinuity in impedance or not it depends upon the vr dimensions most of the tools you know today's uh, 3d field solver tools which are there they should be able to give you an idea of the VI impedance, but there are certain rough estimators that you can use and you can decide as to what VI size to be used over there and what will be the effect of the VI stub and all that. Now, the schematics we use a we we get quite a lot of schematics also along with uh, the cad data uh, and we find that schematics also is such a you know disorganized way of uh, data that many times everyone follows their own, uh, you know, every designer uses his own set of uh, what, he, what I should say standards or conventions and uh, there is very lack, very great lack of standardization in that area. So the, and the schematics being the source of the whole thing, that's extremely critical. One has to try to put as much of the, the guidance for the layout designer in the schematic itself as possible. That is very critical. Critical nets have to be identified. A suitable stack up design should be done at that time itself uh, around you know rather than doing a stack up design much later in the uh, game you know you have to have some stack up right at the beginning when the layout design has to start and that is where you know PCB manufacturers come to a great help okay so if if you can give the characteristics of the entire job, the schematics and all that, we have done a lot of estimation at our end. And we have some internal tools which we are trying to perfect and which will expose them to the wider community as to what kind of stack of will be suitable for that. I think one of the things which the layout designer does not know, but he should know in our opinion, is that what is the fastest, what is the maximum frequency that is, uh, the signal frequency content that is being used for that particular application, what is the fastest rise time or all that. Many of those questions many times are not, uh, uh, that information is not imparted. I feel that that should be given because that would help us in, you know, designing the the right kind of uh, uh, and discipline, 
following a particular kind of discipline in control impedance design and all. Stack up, we talk a lot of planes, stack up, vias, stubs, all those kind of things are critical. So stack up is the heart of the design is for, for a high speed design, high frequency design very much. I talked about the, you know, the short line and the long lines. Sharp bands, 90 degree bands, 45 degree bands, I think I was just hearing about it somehow or the other uh, today morning. A long list of questions from one of the designers came that uh, should I use 90 degree bands or should I use 45 degree bands or should I use rounded and all those kind of things, etc., etc. So th those are questions that you know, guidelines have to be followed for that. We generally would uh, recommend that differential lines should be laid out in one layer as possible, as far as possible, rather than taking them through the VRs. If they have to be taken through the VRs, then it's better to take them through guarded by the ground VRs as well. The differential signaling to be used as far as possible, that is of course the designer's, system designer's role. At the same time, it will also be decided more by the kind of devices that are being used and all that. We see more and more of those things now, nowadays. In the stack up, Today, most of the stack ups, high speed designs, stack ups are such that you have one signal uh, uh, layer and both adjoining layers are planes. At least one of them is a ground, other could be the power plane. So that is the kind of stack up which is mostly nowadays used. Earlier, I remember about 10, 15 years ago, we used to use stack ups where we used to have two signal layers, one plane on the top, one plane below that, used to keep quite a lot of slightly wider gap between the two signal layers to avoid the crosstalk. There used to be rules like orthogonal routing and all those kind of things to be followed. And uh, do not have parallel runs of more than a certain length, you know, on the two adjacent signal layers. But is better in today's environment because number of plane layers, if they are more overall wise, you know, EMI wise, uh, signal integrity wise, power integrity wise, everything is much better. These are the same thing that I was just talking about. This is the field which most designers are not very familiar with about the PCB materials and all that. And I like to speak a little bit more on that one. The every material, at least from a, our Signal integrity perspective has two properties. One is the dielectric constant dK, and the other is the dF, the dissipation factor. For some materials, these do not vary so much with frequency. For other materials, they vary less, uh, or they vary more. For typical FR4, you will find a strong large variation of decay with frequency. 
As frequency increases, dK decreases and the dF increases. That's the typical FR4. Example is isolar 370 HR. Uh, I'll give you some ideas of some other materials over there. Now, why the variation with frequency is a problem? Signal is not composed of only one frequency. Every digital signal is composed of a spectrum of frequencies. And we generally say that FM, the, uh, the highest frequency is this much. The signal does constitute of several frequencies. Now, different frequencies means if, if the decay, if the material properties are changing with frequency, in that case, the, the propagation delay will change. And if the propagation delay changes, that means the different frequency components will travel with different speeds and therefore you will have a rise time degradation is a degradation will take place and that's the reason why in high uh, what you call very high speed applications we would require materials which have a more uniform values of dielectric constant and dissipation factor across the you know wide range of frequencies maybe you know up to 10 gigahertz or so especially uh, in the digital applications maybe the df may not be that much critical initially but definitely in uh, RF and microwave application, that becomes extremely critical. In differential signals, we have also a problem related to the glass weave. So nowadays, during the stack up design, that is becomes critical rather than using, you know, the traditional weave of Typical prepregs like 106, 1080. There are more spread glass kind of uh, you know weaves available for the materials, and they have to be used uh, for more high speed applications. That is also very critical. At very high frequencies, we will have a material losses due to dielectric loss and also due to copper loss because I mean these are some of the uh, you know uh, relations for the copper losses proportional to the square root of the frequency and so on and so forth and the the roughness of the copper so there are low profile copper uh, VLPs, uh, you know, the copper foil attached to the uh, dielectric material has some tooth structure or something like that. The extent of the height of that influences the length of the line at very high frequencies because of the skin effect. So, how to choose the material? I just given the properties of, let us say, about four typical materials over here: 370 HR, 408 HR, I speed, and I MT40. These are all isolar materials. I thought, let me just take one family of materials because if you are using one family of materials, their processing from the manufacturing perspective is similar to each other. So, <coughs> 408 HR is a material which is, let us say, has a DF of 0, 0, 0.009 and has lesser variation compared to 370 HR with frequency, you know, across the frequency, 
high speed of course is pretty good and uh, in the very high speed you know 50 gigahertz kind of applications microwave and other things you know we have the i, I tera and mt40 so i uh, just kind of <coughs> the lower decay of of the material will give you a slightly wider 50 ohm line or wider 100 ohm lines so that is also good and generally if the material df is better is dk is generally lower some of the let us say the excuse me how do i go back yeah okay The, to reduce the capacitance or rather increase the capacitance in the power in the planes you know it's better to have a ground plane and a power plane at close distance to each other at least the, the key power that is being used you know maybe 3.3 volts or 2.5 volts or 5 volts is better to have one you know the, the main power plane and one ground plane very close to each other so provide a lot of high frequency capacitance decoupling capacitance over there all the rules which are good for high signal integrity and less signal degradation they also will in general contribute to lesser emr that's the general uh, rule there a good stack up design will go a long way to have better signal integrity and better emi control stubs of course are a great problem most designers many times and we face this problem a lot in our manufacturing that uh, the design has been done and after that the planes have been flooded with certain design rule that okay between one copper feature and the next copper feature don't use more than 10 mils or something and then suddenly you find a lot of stubs hanging out they all are dangerous they all act as antennas and uh, the the uh, our editing team spends a lot of time in editing all those stubs let us put it this way so uh, uh, that is one aspect of i don't know i mean i remember when the the ecat tools were not that powerful to flood automatically and all that no designer in our time you know 20 30 years back would ever do all those kind of things but today <laughs> automation and then no one looks at it clearly so those can be very very dangerous i put here some estimators for the you know how to calculate the propagation delay per unit time if so you know, th there is a thing called effective dielectric constant. Now, if you are on the, you know, the, the signals on the micro strip, that means on the outer light travel faster. Why do they travel faster? Why they have less propagation delay? Is because on one side you have the air, which is a dielectric constant of almost one on the other side you have a pcb material which is a dielectric constant of something like four or three point four roughly between three to four so effective dielectric constant is of the order of about 2.7 or so there is a there is a 
or I should say approximate way to estimate that. So, these are all empirical formulas based on a lot of uh, em empirical data collected. Effectively, how these formulas have been calculated is this, that you get the uh, idea of the propagation delay from the 2D field solver and then basically apply it to a, you know, uh, put a linear interpolation to that. So, for a micro strip, it is 0 0.64 dielectric constant plus 0 0.36. And if it is solder mass coated, then, you know, you the dielectric, effective dielectric constant goes up because solder mass will give you a layer of roughly between one mil to one and a half, uh, to, to half mil on top of the, your uh, uh, copper and the, uh, the PCB dielectric. So the effective dielectric constant is a little bit more. These are the, some of the materials that we have listed out here and how to basically, what do they, the, 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 the propagation delay for the micro strip, propagation delay for the strip line. So, signals are traveling faster on the outer layer and they are not, they are a little bit slowed on the strip lines. That, so when one is trying to do the length match, actually it is not the length we, we is trying to match. The intent of the matching is to match the time of propagation from one source to the destination, not the length of the line. So if you're taking the signals from, let's say half the travel is on the top and half the travel is somewhere on the inner line, then you better be careful about that. Vr's impedance is not easily estimable. It requires a 3D field solver to be really be able to get the idea of the v impedance of a Vr. These are some of the old formulas which I found in some uh, books, Howard Johnson's books is a good compendium of them plus some of the other, uh, uh, what do you call, papers. So single VR control impedance, you can have, you can actually calculate the capacitance and the inductance separately and then the impedance. Similarly for the signal, now when you're taking a VR from one layer to another and you, you have very high speed kind of situation and you want really a very good design, it's better to take a ground VR also along with that, you know, in parallel to the, your other VR. Now how, what should be the separation, how the impedance can be calculated and all that estimated, this is roughly the formula for that. It's also advised that if you are really having, you have to take the thing and it's a very high speed signal, then instead of one ground VR, you have four VRs symmetrically placed, like the, on the, just like, you know, you have the four ground pins on a RF connector. In the center, you have a signal, something like that. And there the impedance goes down by about half. You will generally find that actually this, you can easily design 50 ohm VRs of very reasonable size by using some of these estimators. Your impedance will not change through the VR. These are of course very well known, uh, you know, very old formulae which most of you must be familiar with. How to calculate the maximum frequency content in a signal based on the fastest rise time of a device or any of the signals that one is coming across. 
If you know only the maximum data transfer rate, like one of the interfaces that is being used, now how to know what is your equivalent price time? This is roughly the formula that you can use. These are all rules of thumb. They are based on certain shape of a, a, a pulse, which, you know, and uh, what is the, of the total width of the pulse in a high speed data transfer, how much is the rise, how much is the fall, how much is the stable period and all that. Based on that, one can do the calculation. So either you know the, the highest frequency or you know the rise time or you know the DTR. One can calculate one from the other and then one can get a good idea of what is the, let us say, the, the critical length below which you can ignore the transmission line effects and above which you have to design those lines as control impedance lines and take care of all the transmission line effects like reflections and all those kind of things, terminations, et cetera. All right, I think that is all that I wanted to say. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, this is too elementary for the audience like this, but I was not aware of that fact. Any questions? Anybody have a question? Is a question Hold on, okay, here. Yeah. I have just a quick question on the via impedance, right? So one signal for vias, is that true for single-ended or also for differential? For both. But single-ended has a, a, let me put it this way. In the differential pair, you may not be able to put the four ground vias very symmetrically. Okay. In the single ended, it is easier to put that way. I think more the way I understand it is the, all the for a differential pair, the ground vias or the shielded via that goes around, that's mostly to carry any common mode signal. So I'm trying to visualize how that impacts the controlled impedance. For the differential, you, yes, you are right. For the differential signals, the ground vias will generally be uh, more for the common mode signal than for the differential signal. The differential signal travel in the signal lines only. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you, uh, the point that you are making possibly is correct. That it may not be that important for differential as it for single end. Yeah, so that means we have to, so let me put it this way. So if we send you a stack up, so we have to have control impedance on these vias on a single end traces. You have tools to check the impedance on the vias? What about the, the formulas that I wrote here? Slightly more calculated versions of that with capacitance, inductance, and the propagation delay and all that stuff. Those tools we are making and putting on our website. Yeah along with our stack up design tool. We have, a, we have already a stack up design tool on our website, but we are upgrading that one to take care of all the material properties and the various materials and the, because, you know, in the stack up, you use prepregs and cores of different thicknesses and different resin contents 
and their decays are not exactly the same. So to answer your question, yes, we are make, putting those estimators over there. Yeah. Atar, if it's, with your permission, I'll send everybody the slides that you've presented here. Sure, sure. So I just wanted to comment on your question. Um, <clears throat> the, the common mode versus differential signals depends a lot on the coupling. And these days, it seems that uh, loose coupling is actually preferred for differential. So you do need to be very concerned about where those vias are and use a 3D solver to get your impedance. Well, just one comment here. I don't know. I, I was, uh, we, we did a lot of simulations on the, the, the coefficient of coupling of a differential pair as to, you know, how to design differential pairs. What is the best way to, because if you want to achieve 100 ohm differential pair, you can achieve it with, you know, four mil line with six mil spacing or, you know, five mil line with 15 mil spacing and all those kind of things. And uh, so which one is preferred? There are two schools of thought to that. One is that the closer the coupling, the better it is. Which means use the spacing to be not more than twice the, you know, the trace width or something like that. You get a, a coefficient of coupling of the order of 15, you know, between 10 to 15 percent uh, or so. Well, if you increase the separation, then the coupling goes down. And you don't have that much of a pair effect, let me put it this way, as you would have otherwise. So would it be correct to say that it's better to use more closely coupled differential pairs? No? See, that's what I'm... Yeah. Um, so part of the reason why is that, um, as you noted, the traces are wider mm -hmm. as they get further apart. And that makes the impedance control uh, easier. So if you have a very narrow trace, the um, variation and etching can, can cause a wider variation in your impedance variation. So the wider apart they are, um, the less that has an impact. And with with the most of us are using differential pairs for uh, for data, right? For high speed data. Um, and in the sense, the main goal is is what you're talking about with skew. Mm -hmm. You want Correct. you want those differential uh, signals to arrive at the other end um, at exactly the same time, and that really is pretty much your only goal. Um, you're not too worried about whether they're coupled or whether they're not. What you're worried about is whether they arrive at the other end at the same time, and that they see the same impedance all the way down. Those kinds of things are. Okay more important than having the tighter coupling, which which could help with, um, you know, uh, crosstalk or interference, but um, ultimately there's a bigger win with the um, loosely coupled traces. True. So effectively what you are saying is that if it is closely coupled, then less of a crosstalk issue. So that is one trade-off. And if they are not closely coupled, then it is easier to control their you know, impedances. And even if some variation between their spacing is there, it will not affect the impedance as much as it would otherwise. At the same time, there is a question of the routing density also comes in over there. Yeah. And if you have, let us say, 20 LVDS you know, lanes going around, you have to separate out one pair from the other pair also, you know, reasonably well. And that becomes a routing density issue again. So there is a trade-off on has to do that. Yeah. But <laughs> actually it's all it's almost like that. But let me let me let me say one thing over here. See, the differential pairs, if you remember, the oldest differential pair in the cable used to be our twisted pair line. 
twisted pair line is almost 90% coupled to each other. On PCB, however close traces you may put in a differential pair, you will rarely get a coupling coefficient of more than 25%. In fact, 25% itself is very difficult to achieve on a PCB, especially when you are edge coupled. We are not talking of broadside coupling. That means, and you know, two traces on the same plane next to each other. The coupling is never more than 20%. I've done so much of calculations on that. So to say that the coupling is very high is also not very true. If you compare it with the actual cables, like coaxial cables or, you know, uh, twisted pair cables or something of that kind. All right, thank you, Tara. Everybody, let's give Tara a great big applause. <laughs> thank you. We really appreciate you coming out and uh, presenting to us today. Um, with that, um, to say that our next meeting is uh, in April. It will be at uh, Amazon, hosted by Altium, and the speaker will be Chris Carlson. He's a FAE from Altium. So um, he is open to suggestions for topics. If somebody wants to get into topics.